what Professor Daryl Hamamoto talked about two or three weeks ago when he was on with us. Very popular guest. I enjoyed talking to him. Was that the revolution, the true renaissance is here, and it is a velvet revolution of ideas, and he's hitting the barbed wire early and has been, I know, persecuted some at the university, he had him threaten to cut his pay because he's been the head of the uh, Asian American Studies. He's the senior ranking professor in the Department of Asian American Studies. I won't go over his whole bio again. He's taught at the University of California, Davis, for most of his academic career. He holds undergraduate and graduate degrees in political science, popular culture studies, and comparative culture. Hamamoto is a senior ranking professor in the Department of Asian American Studies. He's a recognized authority in U.S. media. You see him on national television. Popular culture and sexuality, having published extensively in these areas. He's a recipient of a Rockefeller Foundation Research Fellowship and is a Fulbright Scholar, Japan. His current project is a volume that out uh, outlines the principles of the New World Order Theory and is directed in the current generation college, university undergraduates, in search of alternatives to the dominant foundation-guided corporatist curriculum. And so we have plenty of time with him. I'm going to skip this network break coming up. He's so polite, he'll pause constantly, and I'll rush in and take over like a wolf. But I want you to talk about whatever you want to first. Did you get any repercussions coming on? What do you make of all the stuff happening with Russia? Uh, what's your take on the border crisis expanding? Since you were on, it's confirmed, it's premeditated. Uh, thank you for joining us, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, all the uh, reactions and responses that I've been receiving have been 100% positive. Wow. That's, that's unusual. Uh, I assume that the university administration is not paying much attention at this point. They are narrowly focused on uh, eviscerating what remains of public education. And once they've removed that, then the rest of the society will fall. And part of their strategy is this uh, engineered border crisis that I, I will speak to today, hopefully, uh, for your readers, for your viewers, nationally, internationally, uh, add a little bit of insight uh, so far as academic uh, research is concerned to expand our critical lexicon here. Go ahead, uh, because, go ahead. Yeah, because it goes beyond uh, the term uh, cloud or the phrase uh, cloud and piven is a uh, shorthand for this sort of left progressive strategy of intensifying conflict so that the economic system, the culture society will implode, will self-destruct. And of course, the, um, the objective here is to usher in some form of centralized uh, corporatist government, socialist, if you will, government. This is classic Leninism, by the way, the notion that everything has to get worse before it gets better. This is the part that they leave out. So that's, that's important. That's an important framework to understand. But I want to more specifically introduce another pair of ass clowns from academia uh, by the name of Rosaldo and Ong. Rosaldo, Ong is spelled O-N-G. The Rosaldo element uh, covers the Latino population of illegal aliens and the mass influx of populations from Latin America. And the Ong component uh, addresses the large influx of uh, impoverished Asians, which are going to be the next phase of it. I don't know when that's going to happen. We're looking at Central American illegal aliens currently, but uh, by and by there will be bringing in, uh, that is the people who are orchestrating to bring in large numbers of people from the um, probably the Western regions, the politically unstable regions of China. So what has happened in, uh, in the academic world is that these foundations, many of which you have, uh, have uh, identified uh, over the years in your program, the Rockefellers, the Soros, more recently the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, have been pouring in lots of money to uh, social science departments, humanities, and uh, for the most part, they, they own it, lock, stock, and barrel. And they brought forth uh, these two individuals. This person's name is Renato Dosaldo formerly professor of anthropology at uh, Stanford University in Palo Alto, right? This is uh, uh, Yale Skull and Bones West. Yeah, he was there. Now he's at uh, NYU, New York University. He retired from Stanford. And what NYU does is they take uh, retired professors from name brand prestigious institutions and they hire them and, and they uh, start their second career there. And the other person is uh, a little bit further up north, and that sort of silicon information IT uh, skull and bones bohemian growth territory. 
Uh, her name is Ai Wa Ong. She's a Malaysian Chinese, Straits Chinese, Pernang Khan, as they're referred to. She's also a professor of anthropology, but she as, is uh, at UC Berkeley. Now, these two people, unbeknownst to the general American public, have articulated, uh, they've redefined what citizenship is. Very clever, very clever. They've redefined it so that we have now two or three generations of university students, graduates, and graduate students, professionals, people who are in public policy, attorneys, you name it, who have now been imbued with this, uh, this ideology that people like Rosaldo, and there are others as well, these are the two main people that I've identified, that Rosaldo and Ong have cultivated. All right, and remember, by the way, that uh, Barama Mama, that's Barack Obama, I just kind of inflate his, conflate his name to Barama, but Barama Mama, Stanley Ann Dunham was also an anthropologist, was she not? She was a cultural anthropologist. She was trained as an anthropologist by the East-West Center, which has CIA connections at the University of Hawaii. She was sent over to Indonesia to supposedly study indigenous cultures. And um, what happens is that research gets kicked up to the big boys and they figure out how to go in there. They read the ethnological literature and they can use that uh, in order to destroy the indigenous culture so they can bring in uh, their, their shock troops. Or That's what they did right troops. after she gave them the info. They engaged in a Absolutely. bunch of extermination. Yeah. Absolutely. So, he, so you're already connecting the, the, the connections between the anthropological sciences, Rosaldo and Ong, and uh, people like uh, Dunham who are more prominently uh, It'd be like known. space aliens if they wanted to take over, putting humanoids in to blend in and study things before they attack. Absolutely. You know, this, uh, I was reading uh, Mongol uh, history, culture, military strategy. They always had people, they didn't just come in there and charge in their Mongol ponies. They always had people going into the local culture, asking questions, fitting, fitting in, trading with them, gaining intelligence, uh, identifying their vulnerabilities, learning a little bit of their language, their culture, their folk ways, and then taking it back to the great Khan. And then they would come in and invade. So this is a, uh, a really uh, old pattern uh, strategy. And this is this, what's going on right now here in uh, 2014. So what Rosaldo came up with uh, is this notion of cultural citizenship, cultural citizenship. Now, uh, this is already beginning to destroy our common understanding of citizenship, which is black and white. Either you're a citizen or you're a non-citizen. And even further, this is a direct attack on the nation state. This is a direct attack and assault on this notion of national sovereignty. And as you spoke uh, to it earlier in this very program, it's not really about borders. It's about national sovereignty. And to reiterate, to, to underscore what you said previously, why is national sovereignty important? Well, it is a firewall. It's a protection for, of Americans or any other nationalities against these global centralized banking families of, um, of ancient origins who want uh, unipolar absolute power, whether it's um, orchestrated from the city of London, Geneva, one of their uh, centers. And we're all going to suffer for it. I mean, if you think your government today is inaccessible, is not listening to you, and is distant, and you think you're alienated now, just try to appeal for a redress of grievance to a, to a global centralized government. It's going to be impossible. When there's no borders, no one can communicate with each other, and they have little racial and ethnic leaders that are part of the new Politburo under the corporations who are exempt offshore. It's the ultimate form of neo-feudalism. Absolutely. Yes. We're going back to the uh, feudal model, the high-tech... Uh, Techno-fascist, as a friend of mine, Doug Kellner at UCLA, calls it techno-fascist uh, overlay in order to uh, to uh, manage this, which makes it much more uh, difficult to. Uh, uh, well, how do you? I mean, I want you to continue to break down how they're redefining things, Certainly. who these people are, because yes. it's yes. important to actually see, you know, who these big foundations are funding and and what their plan is. But after that, I just want to ask this now, but but answer it now or later, because I don't want to interrupt you. But how do you communicate? to people from Eastern Europe or people from Guatemala or people that grew up in dirt floor villages, how do you communicate with them this information when I'm talking to PhDs in sociology and they can't even understand it? It's all written you know, in the globalist manuals. You've read them. You're smart. You get it. I've read them. I get it. 
But then it's so alien to the average person because they're not premeditatedly uh, technocrats who see people as things to be programmed. I, I just don't know how it's so simple, but it's also so complex. Well, the average person and the audience uh, that I'm trying to reach are undergraduates, uh, either in the United States and the English speaking world. These are the people that are going into the professions. These are the people who are the educators. And they have gone now through three or four generations, four or five years, I count as a generation, of Rosaldo and Ong being programmed to accept this model of uh, society and, and politics and government. They accept it. So what I'm trying to do is to identify the origins, the sources, and name names on who is responsible for this takeover in um, an academic culture. And these are two individuals of a larger, larger complex that's heavily funded. I'm just using them as a shorthand. So once we educate these new generations of undergraduates on, uh, and of course they accept it blindly, these, these are professors and they have no frame of reference. So they, they, they just uncritically uh, uh, in chest everything that these people are saying they're like sponges so you're saying the answer exactly. is what you're doing be bold you know get threatened but you're doing it go in right. and try to deprogram them because you're not even exactly. telling them your view you're saying here's the man behind the curtain look they're right. saying it they're right. saying it so let's i'm sorry to interrupt let's move on to the next person and then. there's there's a second part to it uh, which is uh, what are the alternatives which per perhaps i can speak uh, yes sir to at a later date maybe you can have me back on for a back to school special i have a program that's going to uh uh, rock the foundations of the University of California uh, because uh, it's it's not enough to just diagnose the problem. We also have to come up with uh, solutions. So yes, going back to your analogy of the sponge, uh, what I'm trying to do is squeeze out all the dreck out of a SpongeBob and uh, fill that sponge up with with important information, like uh, this notion of cultural citizenship and what does it what does it really mean to be a a, a uh, an American uh, Honduran a Russian, as opposed to being someone who's a Spanish-speaking person who happens to live in the United States, who's going to be part of this massive uh, welfare system or part of Section 8 housing. I was about to say, under this globalism, this cultural Marxism, this cultural citizenship, you really are like a refugee worldwide and have no rights, and that's what they're saying. And so these that's people right. literally are setting the new model and it's, it, it's a borderless, landless vagabond who doesn't even know how to work the system. They, they are, and of course, they're oblivious to this, but these uh, illegal uh, aliens are uh, really, really vulnerable. They're like a mobile weaponized uh, shock troops here, and, and they're going to have to do the bidding of the people that, that are controlling them, which will be primarily Latinas now for the, for the um, Central Americans. And, I mean, it's a slave army. It's a slave army. It's the reserve army that Marx wrote about. Um, uh, the lumpen proletariat, as he referred to it, that is used historically to destabilize uh, regimes. They're the ones that have the pitchforks and the torches. To and uh, uh, but in this case, it's being uh, directed against uh, the middle class. So I'm addressing the middle class, the educated middle class, the undergraduates of the University of California, the University of Texas, all the great public institutions, and from there uh, we will uh, educate the the larger public just by doing, by being in administration and, and in government and the uh, field of law and medicine, uh, you name it, because the medical profession. Professor, is really something just well. clicked. Yes. Normally what yes. you cover gets a lot of attention, and, and obviously your interview here got a lot of attention in the alternative press, the new press, but they're smart. You, they threatened to cut your pay or fire you or whatever. You didn't back down. You're a well-known figure, respected. Now they realize that didn't work, so they're trying to ignore this and hope that, uh, because I can, obviously, you're ready to be persecuted. You're ready to use them coming after you, as you said last time, to bring more attention to this authoritarianism. So they're being smart. They're choosing to fight when they want to fight. And I would imagine that'll come somewhere down the road against you. They'll come yeah. sneaking in the night. Mm -hmm. Well, my back-to-school special uh, is going to flesh them out. They're, gonna, they're not going to be able to ignore my back-to-school special, which I'm going to roll out in about a... Uh, another two or three weeks, maybe, you know, right around the time that everybody's going back to school. Right now, there's a vacuum, right? No one's, no one's paying attention that it's the summer break. Uh, but let me continue. That's Rosaldo, cultural citizenship. I'd like your viewers, your listeners to, to ponder that term, uh, his innovation. And they're rewarded, of course. They're given status. They're given more grants. They're given prestigious uh, academic posts. And, and uh, 
they have been brought to Washington, D.C. To, to chit chat with the political leaders and the, probably the intelligence community. So this was in 2003. It's relatively recent. This is why we're still talking about Cloward and Piven, or we should be talking about Rosaldo and Ong, right? Because the, as, as it said, the generals are always fighting the last battle. This is the current battle. This is the battle that we're waging now is against the Rosaldo and Ong uh, model, not which is an extension of Cloward yes. and uh, Piven. Okay, let me move to uh, Iwa Ong, who's another uh, foreign-born intellectual. Uh, this is a model. They don't just cream and cultivate um, uh, people from, from out of the country who are impoverished. They also like to cream uh, intellectual labors like IT, information technology, computer technology. First it was Taiwan, uh, then India, and now China. And uh, the Silicon Valley people aren't, don't realize it yet, but they're also going to be looking for work, these engineers. Stay there. Uh, Tell us about the yes. other professor when We're we come back. Professor Thanks. Hamamoto is our guest. Powerful information. And we're going to break down from an insider, inside of it, how this is working and the plan to bring in the North American Union and a planetary corporate run fascist world government. It's so fascinating. I'm trying to not interrupt, but I am. I apologize. I'm Alex Jones, your host, Professor Daryl Hamamoto, who's one of the uh, leaders um, and has been the head of the uh, Department of Asian American Studies at UC Davis. And he's inside the system seeing all of this. And, and, and look, it's really very simple. And I know most of you know all this, but we have to reach out to middle class people that can understand it. And to executives and to pastors and to cultural leaders and explain, look, there's a sophisticated cultural modeling control system developed by the empires in the last, well, thousands of years. Julius Caesar wrote about it a lot but really codified in the last 200 by the British Empire to administer and control countries along ethnic and religious balkanization lines. So to control that, they've artificially come in and put more of this in, in the name of political correctness, making it worse, selling it on the idea of equality of men. Just like the Illuminati said they would push equality, but actually their secret was they would use that to get control and bring in inequality. So that's the name of the game is they, they claim all this equality and fraternity of men and women. But when you look at what they do, they bring in dehumanization, dumbing down, deindustrialization, destabilization. And then after they've cut your legs off, they give you crutches in Iraq or Libya, you name it, and say, see the favor we did. We burned your house down and then called a fire truck afterwards. So it is a very wicked management system. And it did not even get full power itself. The West had a little bit more freedom than other cultures, and in my view. And so it was able to produce more science and technology. That was then hijacked, leveraged by a technocracy. And we're now a couple hundred years into this. And now we're going into the end game stages. And you can debate politics all day and the window dressing of the false spectrum discussions. But you've got to pull the curtain back and look at the real machinery behind it and the little man running it or there's no beating it. And that's why there's a compulsion to say tinfoil hat, or you know, there's no world government, or there's no corruption, because they don't even want the debate to begin. There's no NSA watching you or listening. That's preposterous, or of course they're listening, and it's preposterous, you don't like it. There's no police state. Okay, there is, but it's for your own good. This is a dehumanizing system. So I wanna go back to Professor Daryl Hamamoto to be able to break this down uh, and go over where he sees us going, finish up with, you know, recap the first professor at, at NYU, and, and then go to the other professor, because he's trying to introduce the term. We know about Cloward and Piven. That itself is just one popularized example of this thought of order out of chaos, this Leninist idea, destroy it, build it back up in their new image. So we're introducing the new uh, current war, in his view, and I agree with him, what's currently happening so we can identify it, educate others, be aware of it, and defeat it. They're trying to control the lexicon we use, a.k.a. Ingsoc, right out of 1984, where we can't even communicate with each other. When you hear Michelle Obama say, don't use the word bossy, that's not some Kurt Vonnegut satire. That's real, and they want you to learn that 
every day words are bad and that you better only repeat what they say and that's going to change day to day as Carl Rove bipartisan told the New York Times we control reality we control the language you will take whatever new reality we give you we're talking about the end of free will so I'm going to shut up professor you've got the floor go ahead yeah, so far as the uh, first lady boy is concerned, uh, her, her scolding us for using the term bossy, I have a suggestion for her. How about Biachi? Would that be better for the first lady boy? I, I don't know. But anyway, let me finish up with Rosaldo here with this notion of um, cultural citizenship. Uh, part of this is to uh, completely undermine this notion of national sovereignty. And the implication that is, is that if you are a Spanish-speaking person, or if you're part of uh, the National Council of La Raza, if, you part of, if you're part of the race, La Raza, or you are part of the people, uh, then you, you are a citizen. The, the, the borders be damned. You are a citizen. You belong here. It's your birthright because you are part of this new reformulation of what citizenship is, cultural citizenship, quote unquote, 2003. It's important to understand the genesis of these terms because they leak into, uh, into everyday discourse and they, they affect political policy. The second person I wanted to uh, talk about, and she's handling the Asian end of it because that's, that's going to be coming down the pike very soon. Large numbers of, of politically unstable, economically underdeveloped areas in China being brought into the United States, and they can they can dictate that to the United States because they own so much of our uh, of our debt, and they want some sort of exchange. And one of the uh, the exchanges can be the exportation of political dissent to the United States, which is only going to compound the problem. And they have a ready-made front here. They have a uh, a whole uh, two or three generations of educated middle-class people in the professions who have been reading the work and worshiping the uh, intellectual superstar because these are superstars. It's just like Hollywood. There's a star system in academia, believe it or not. We never hear about them, but there, there is one. Sure, and, and then everyone else starts parroting what the superstar is, exactly. hoping they get a grant. Right. They come from the elite institutions. They're the name brand marquee designer institutions. And every state university professor has to follow suit or liberal arts colleges you know, down to the community college level. They set the tone, right? Uh, they're the, 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 the head fish in the pilot fish uh, school. So... There's this uh, person, her name's Aiwa Ong, O-N-G, and she came up with a similar concept, uh, similar to Rosaldo, and she calls it flexible citizenship. Oh. Flexible citizenship, 1999. She wrote an entire foundation-funded book on it. This made her reputation. So it's flexible. If you break it down now, it, it makes about as much sense as flexible pregnancy. Right. You're either pregnant or you're not pregnant. You're either a citizen or you're a non-citizen. But by, by playing around with the language, uh, Orwell calls it Ingsoc. Uh, it's an old strategy. By reconceptualizing, remolding our, our perceptual basis and then teaching generations of educated people that this is the way to go, uh, then you have frozen any sort of discussion. And by the way, this is, uh, this is important. This is one of the reasons why Unlike uh, the uh, border agents, unlike the military, unlike growing numbers of, of individuals and in all these important institutions, maybe even the majority of them now who are, who, are, who are keyed in and are aware of the New World Order endgame, academia is utterly silent on this. This is the key reason, because we've already had two or three generations of undergraduates, graduate students, creating new uh, generations of, of the professoriate who have... Um, who have who have monopolized any sort of discussion of this. And my function here is to, to uh, put this out to the general public, to uh, uh, have them understand what they're uh, uh, paying for, so far as their tuition is concerned, for their students, to, for their children to learn. So it's, uh, it's uh, open kimono time, if you will, for you here. I'm going to just, uh, just open it up, full disclosure, and uh, expose whatever I can from the inside of what, uh, what uh, the academic community has been doing to help usher in this new world order endgame. It's a really, really crucial component. And it's so important that, as I mentioned last time, they even brought one of their top um, uh, capos in, uh, Janet Napolitano, to be the president of the University of California system in uh, Oakland, California. So these are the two... Um, superstars in this in this uh, framework. Now, there's another component, if I may change uh, focus slightly, 
And that is what I alluded to earlier, and that's the GLBT agenda, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transsexual. Uh, and it has nothing to do with uh, preserving the rights, the dignity of any of these groups. This is just simply another power block that is being exploited by the Rockefeller Foundation, Soros, and whoever else that gives them money, uh, private corporations, you name it. It's a uh, synthetically created, installed power block that's going to be, that already is in place, by the way. I've talked to other coll colleagues, and the upper level administration is already stocked with individuals like this. And the reason being is that if you criticize any aspect of the curriculum, any of the superstars within the university system, or even trivial points like banning smoking on the campus entirely, even in your own car, then automatically you become a homophobe. And no one wants to be stigmatized or labeled as being anti-human or homophobic or racist, whatever it is. So that's, that's the, the second phase. The first part, part was with um, putting in a um, person of color in presidency and saying, oh, well, you can't criticize them, otherwise you're a racist. So the GLBT agenda is installed. It's uh, very much um, uh, an extension of what is uh, referred to in this critical community as uh, cultural Marxism. But again, cultural Marxism is an outdated phrase. Uh, it's uh, fighting the last war. And just briefly, let me, um, like I did in the case of Rosaldo and Ong, identify three GLBT academic superstars that your viewers should be aware of. And they have had a huge, huge, huge impact on how the educated middle class, including its professionals, its attorneys, its physicians, its, uh, its uh, people in the sciences, they've had a huge impact and there's very little discussion in, of these people in the larger uh, society. Professor, get into yes. them. This is, this is critical okay. information. Great. There's this one individual, uh, her and him, because she goes by a dual uh, gender identity. She goes by Jack slash Judith Halberstam. She's at the University of Southern California, USC, or as we refer to it, the University of Spoiled Children. And uh, she wrote a classic text called Female Masculinity, 1998. Talk about Baphomet, female masculinity. And she's talking about how gender roles are artificial, they're social constructions, and she lives her, sli uh, lives her life and um, as a man slash woman. Uh, if you want to look up her... Uh, photos online, you can see what I mean. But so she's a, a, a key uh, superstar. She has an endowed chair at the University of California. This is how they reward them. And again, this is nothing about being a transgender, transsexual, or being queer. It has nothing, very little to do with it. Uh, the second person is at the University of California, Berkeley. Her name's Judith Butler. She's famous for the incomprehensibility of her really arcane and abstruse uh, writings, but her contribution, contribution is 1990, it's called Gender Trouble. And again, her attack is on these uh, notions of man, of woman, of female, and male. This is the cultural assault on gender, on uh, really on humanity, uh, because they, they call it uh, uh, transhumanism or post uh, or uh, trans transsexualism, but it's really uh, post-sexuality, post-humanism, where the state, uh, after this point, takes control of reproduction and of sexuality in general. And so for those that don't know, just to back you up, I mean, Huxley, yes. whose brother ran the UN program, was the founder of the transhumanist movement. You have the pop transhumanism that sounds nice, but internally, it's Brave New World. They pick your sex. You go into puberty when you're five, you're a drone, you're programmed. So they use the civil rights movement saying, let's be nice to people that are naturally this way or, or you know, have this right. proclivity or nice people and let's hype it and then make it where people have to do what we want because it's, a, it's an engine pulling a whole political train that is a post-human world and that's in all their text. They're not yes. even hiding that, but then no. they know that the average person isn't aware of this. It's just like... The chemicals in the food and water with the frogs, you know, now uh, having, quote, gender trouble. It's not that we're homophobic <laughs> against gay frogs. They're not gay frogs, folks, like, you know, some, some Romans were, you know, you know, one way or the other. The point is that's always gone on. It is an artificiality being projected for an end of humanity scenario. That's their words, not ours. And I know you've studied it, so get into it.
That's precisely it. I mean, it's interesting that you picked up on the, uh, the biochemical and the science behind this, because they are doing, in the humanities and the social science, what they're doing is providing cover for the bio, the re-engineering of the human endowment, male, male and female, through biochemical re-engineering through the BPA. You talk about it constantly in, in your program and your, your guests uh, speak to it. To these issues, but they are—they're normalizing through their teaching. They are normalizing this post-human, transgender reality that is a part of a biological programming that was announced in public by people like uh, Aldous Huxley. It comes from the same branch. This is the the most recent bud, the green bud of this this eugenics uh, tree that has been uh, growing and growing since the time, at least of, of, of Huxley. Uh, the third person, okay, we've, we have um, uh, Judith Butler, we've just finished up with here. The third person in this uh, triumvirate is uh, Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick, deceased. She was at Duke University, which was one of the capitals of uh, quote unquote literal, uh, literary theory, which is part of this, by the way. Maybe I can get into this later on. There was something called theory with a capital T that was imported from Europe in order to, uh, I think, uh, uh, neutralize any sort of political dissent or awareness that was coming out of the humanities, largely out of the anti-Vietnam War uh, organization. So they brought in something from overseas, and Yale and places like Duke uh, were were instrumental in bringing this in. So her name is uh, uh, Sedgwick, D.C. She was at Duke University, uh, made out of uh, uh, family tobacco money, you know, these, the Duke uh, fortune. And then uh, she wound up at the uh, Cooney Graduate Center, City University of New York. And she is one of the um, uh, kingpins, or queenpins, rather, of uh, queer theory. And her classic test, text is, uh, was published in 1990, and the title there is The Epistemology of the Closet. Right. The Epistemology, this is the philosophical underpinnings of what later became queer theory, which, again, is, um, I mean, they view it as a standalone, but really it's an adjunct to this larger eugenics uh, reengineering uh, of the human species to, to move us into the, the uh, post-human world. This is how it works. It's very subtle. It's incremental. It's uh, part of this larger strategy uh, of uh, transformation. Of course, there'll be no resistance because there are no more men. And toward that end, I wanted to talk briefly about the uh, Elliot Roger situation. And out of respect to his family and to the victims, I won't go into the specifics of that scenario. Uh, I just want to, I'm putting his name out there as being emblematic of what is happening uh, at major institutions, as well as liberal arts colleges, community colleges all over the country. It's probably hap happening in Europe, Western Europe. It's happening in Japan. Uh, but uh, you're seeing larger and larger numbers of male students who fit the Elliot Roger prototype. They have severe gender confusion. Sometimes it's referred to as gender dysphoria. Uh, they're obsessed about it. Uh, they've been on psychotropics most of their life, and now they're, they're being dosed heavily by these gender-bending uh, hormones. And the university, instead of addressing these issues, because they manufacture these gender-bending hormones, because they are an adjunct of the pharmaceutical combine, they instead have uh, put together university student services and counseling services to, uh, to help serve as sort of the mission control uh, therapeutic center to normalize this transformation. This is All what's right, we'll going. be right back. Just, here's the bottom line. There is a public agenda to end human fertility and to reprogram the population in preparation to phase out most of the population. And there are arguments to reduce the population out there, and there's a lot of problems with humanity. But there's the artificiality of trying to make us failures so that we can be controlled and dealt with more easily and removed by an elite who I see as at the bottom of the barrel for humanity. And, and, and that's where I leave it. Uh, it's just that as the infertility spikes, Next, it'll be, why are you against people that have infertility? They're in their own group now, too. So I've seen how the very groups behind so much of this will then manage the crises they've helped create, as the professor was just saying, and then they've dumbed the public down to just bleeding names, like double plus good, where there's not even a discussion of anything.
that is just you're a racist or you're a blah blah blah. Well, meanwhile, all the real racism and stuff gets ignored. It really is a dumbing down. It's very dangerous. We'll have to have you back again soon, Professor. We're almost out of time. Got three or four minutes. Go ahead and finish up. Put bookends on what you've said so far today. And I hope you'll come back and premiere your back to school special here in the next two, three weeks on air with us. I'd love to come back and, and roll that one out uh, for the benefit of the University of California. Yes, uh, we're heading uh, in the name of queer theory and JLBT rights, uh, which we all believe in is sort of a civil protections right for anybody, for any individual of any orientation. Uh, in that guise, though, uh, what's happening is that the, the end game of post-sexuality is slowly being realized. This is the goal, as uh, you have spoken to it in, in your own documentary, uh, Endgame. This uh, helps realize this dream of uh, authoritarians from Plato all the way to Darwin, and that is elite control of human reproduction. So I'll, hopefully today I just uh, gave you a little bit of insight, a little bit of behind the scenes insight on how this is orchestrated in the academic curriculum and how generations of educated Americans and Western Europeans and overseas as well uh, are being um, uh, infused with, with this, this uh, new world order uh, humanistic outlook, which is really anti-human. What do your colleagues say? Because I mean, they're they're smart. They they, um, they all know this stuff's in the mainline literature. At the uh -huh. technocrat level, it's not hidden. I mean, what do they say to you? Uh, when they speak to me, they uh, look at me askance, and uh, I think that most of my opposition comes from my, my immediate colleagues because uh, they've been bought off into it. They're, they're smart, intelligent people, but like any other institution, the reigning uh, operational philosophy is go along to get along, and this is true for academia, which is ironic because supposedly we're here in order to blaze new trails and come up with new insights and, and information so that we could help move our civilization a little bit further along here. But that doesn't, it doesn't work that way in practice. Well, there's the paradox. They're in their ivory towers, <laughs> uh, scared of you, but out in the open, what you're saying, you know, really people have been supportive. And, and yeah. so I, I think that's where the disconnect is. I don't think this overall program is gonna go the way the technocrats thought. I don't believe so. And that's why I'm going outside the tower I'm going over their heads and going directly to the public. And I thank you for the opportunity to reach such, such large numbers of people, because this is how we are going to erode the foundations of this artificial uh, tower of ivory tower of Babel that uh, has been erected. It's very, very vulnerable. And, and I'd like to leave on an optimistic note, the educated middle class historically around the world has never been larger. And that's why their control system, their snoop systems, their IT, uh, the NSA, that's why they're going to fail, because our intelligence and our will is far, far greater than theirs. And that's not hype or a pep talk. It's true. Uh, that's why they're trying to move so quick right now, because they know they're in trouble. The human desire for true freedom is much stronger than their desire to control and dominate us. Professor, thank you so much for the time. Professor Hamamoto, I'm coming.